Well, good afternoon and welcome to Your DIY Health here on the Spreaker Radio Network. I'm your host, Sergeant Jim Ram, retired. You can call me Sarge. It's Thursday, January 12th, 2023. And normally we talk health, but on Thursdays, as we have for the last several years, <laughs> we've been talking about the Constitution and government and all kinds of crazy stuff and, and basically putting the truth out that you didn't get taught by the coach in high school. And uh, the one thing I'm going to say is check out the website, yourdiyhealth.com. That's Y-O-U-R-D-I-Y, like do it yourself, health, H-E-A-L-T-H, yourdiyhealth.com. All kinds of information there, including the information on the new iTeraCare device, which is taking the world by storm. And uh, there's all kinds of information there. Just check it out. If you have any con uh, questions, you can contact me. Um, but with that, we're just going to get rolling here. And we've got Mike and DW and Cal with us today and a whole bunch of folks in the Jitsi room, which is great to see. And uh, we're just going to let these guys take over and uh, see where we end up, because I haven't got the title for today's talk. So <laughs> let's just turn it over to Mike. Have at it, guys. Good to see you. Don't forget to unmute. Uh-oh. What happened? Did we die? Everybody asleep? Did we lose Mike again? Ah, uh, not sh No, I see him there, and he's unmuted. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you got a lovely hey, live radio. Can you hear me now? Ah, there we go. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, okay. Well, gosh, uh, guy, we've uh, been stuttering through this thing here prior to uh, signing on. But anyway, I kind of wanted to jump the rails today. I kind of wanted to go in another direction, but I think... Uh, uh, and I posted it on uh, Facebook uh, and other places. Jim, I'm sorry I didn't send it to you. But uh, what I wanted to do today was to give everyone probably the founding era of America is very critical. But there's also another period of our, in our history, which uh, we uh, mistakenly call the Civil War. And uh, I believe that the institutionalized ignorance that was brought to us uh, by the uh, Marxist school system has led us down different trails. So what I wanted to do today is I've got a 25 question quiz on our second war for independence. And I will uh, go through it. If you've got a pen and a piece of paper, what have you, or uh, something to type on, uh, kind of think about the questions and then we'll jump into them uh, as we move forward. Question number one, what was the first state to secede? Number two, what city was the first capital of the Confederacy? Number three, after South Carolina seceded on Christmas night, Union military forces under Major Robert Anderson, under cover of darkness, his men all dressed in civilian attire, moved by boat and occupied Fort Sumter. Was that action an act of war? Question number four, Secretary of State William Seward assured the Confederacy through Judge Campbell that Fort Sumter would be evacuated almost two months before Confederates fired on the fort. Also, Abraham Lincoln had secretly ordered the resupply of Fort Sumter. Do either of these events constitute an act of war? Number five, how many casualties were the result of the bombardment of Fort Sumter? Number six, were the Union forces at Fort Sumter made prisoners of war or released? Number seven, did Abraham Lincoln order an armed attack on Fort Pickens at Pensacola, Florida on March the 31st, 1861? Number eight, what is the significance of Fort Barrancas, B-A-R-R-A-N-C-A-S? Number nine, who was placed in command of Confederate forces in 1861? Number 10, in the Battle of First Manassas, or First Bull Run, who were the opposing commanders? Number 11, whose military strategy was most responsible for the Confederate victory at First Manassas? Number 12, what battle strategy was offered to General Lee and President Jeff Davis on multiple occasions, but was rejected five times? Number 13, in the Peninsula Campaign, what Confederate cavalry commander actually rode a circle around the Union Army, taunting them the whole time? 
Number 14, who was Stonewall Jackson's cavalry leader during the early Valley Campaign of 1862? 15, which federal commander did Abraham Lincoln order to put down the rebellion of the Santee Sioux in Minnesota in 1862? 16, which Confederate general is responsible for giving Thomas Jackson the nickname Stonewall? Number 17, what Cherokee chief wrote his people's reasons for siding with the Confederacy, citing the Declaration of Independence on multiple occasions? Number 18, in Lincoln's first inaugural address, what reason did he provide for which he would invade the southern states? Number 19, who was the author of the Corwin Amendment, which was passed by both houses of the Congress and then sent to the states for ratification? Number 20, what was Lincoln's response to Chief Justice Taney stating Lincoln's ignoring of the act of habeas corpus was illegal? Number 21, what is the importance of the legal case called Ex Parte Merriman? Number 22, which Confederate general was killed early in the Battle of Shiloh? Number 23, what Confederate general was known as the Wizard of the Saddle? Number 24, under what circumstances did Stonewall Jackson submit his resignation in 1862? 25, who was the most competent general from either side and who was the most incompetent? Cite an example as to your opinion or belief. 26, a bonus question. What is the logical difference between the Revolutionary Army attack on Fort Ticonderoga and the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter? There you have your 26 questions. And Jim, I am going to send them to you so you can post them, which I should have done before. I apologize. All righty. So, uh... Let's see here. You folks want to start with number one, and let's see who uh, gets that one best, or Cal or DW. Do you have any comments on the quiz before we begin? No. Mm. Yeah, I'm. <clears throat> I'm just listening. I listen to the list, and I'm. I'm going to do bad. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I wrote down questions as quick as, or answers as quick as I could. Michael gave those questions pretty quick. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's look at number one. And real and quick, can, guys, we, before we, we start. We can discuss this for sure. If, uh, if you're not actively speaking, make sure you mute because there's a lot of sniffing and snorting and things in the background that's uh, kind of covering things up. So if you can, just uh, keep your finger on the mute button and just unmute when you need to and then get it back on if you would. Thanks. Okay, the easiest question. What was the first state to secede? South Carolina. You got that right, Jim. That's one for Very me. Good. <laughs> that's that's one, that's one and that's only. One for, one for Sarge. <laughs> Woohoo. That's it. Sarge got it right. <laughs> any, any, <laughs> uh, any debate or any questions on that? Okay, moving to number two. What city was the first capital of the Confederacy? Charleston? Nope. Nope. See, I told you. Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, you better not have looked that up, Cal. I didn't. Okay. All right. Uh, you're correct. Okay. Now, here is one that I think we should discuss because this one is critical. After South Carolina seceded on Christmas night... Union military forces under Major Robert Anderson, under cover of darkness, his men all dressed in civilian attire, moved by boat and occupied Fort Sumter. Was such an action an act of war? Thoughts? I'd say yes. Well, I think you're right, because it's an act of subterfuge, because how many people know that uh, prior to South Carolina seceding, there were no Union forces at Fort Sumter? <laughs> well, Mike? Yes, sir? The, the mere fact of soldiers taking off their uniforms and putting on civilian clothing, that constitutes espionage mm -hmm. or spying, which is a hangable offense under most war doctrine so if they were caught in civilian attire as a military person doing military 
things, that's considered spying, and you get hung for it. Mm-hmm. As, as well, I understand it. <laughs> well, I, that is a very valid point, and I would be in agreement with you, yet all of us who have gone through the education system are told repeatedly that the war began because the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter. So let me see, Jim, I'm trying to figure out how to get these questions to you, buddy. Um, uh, and if you got it like in a, uh, just a regular document, you could just email it. Be the easiest. Okay. I'm getting ready to do that post haste and, uh, any more discussions on, uh, what we are looking at right now. Was there an actual declaration of war just by seceding? No. Uh, are you, Rick, are you uh, of the opinion that secession was unconstitutional? No, I've just uh, asked on the point of was there a declaration of war? When was that act? When was there an actual declaration of war? There never was. There was also never a peace treaty. That's interesting. <laughs> yes, very much interesting, and I totally agree with you, and thanks for asking that question, Rick. But uh, if anyone uh, is in the group that believes that secession was unconstitutional, please let me know, because I'd like to address that. Jim, the email's on the way, buddy. All righty, I will convert it into a PDF and get it posted. All right. Okay. Secretary of State William Seward assured the Confederacy, because they had a peace committee, which Lincoln refused to talk to, but he sent his Secretary of State, William Seward, to do the negotiations. And so Seward assured Judge Campbell of that uh, Confederate Peace Commission that Fort Sumter would be evacuated in January of 1861. Fort Sumter was fired upon on April of 1861. So does the promise of the Secretary of State constitute an agreement that should have been adhered to? D.W., you had a thought? <clears throat> well, I mean, you would... Uh... Uh, common common sense would say that uh, it would be binding, but uh, obviously it uh, after the fact it has no uh, significance. It doesn't fall in with the narrative, so you can. Yeah, I mean, if 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 you don't historically make it a a point of a point of order, then. It has no relevance in the minds of people. It doesn't fit the narrative. So, All right. Uh, I think one of the things uh, where I, that I was remiss in covering here was talking about Fort Sumter and the move by uh, Major Anderson from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter under the cover of darkness in civilian uniforms or in civilian clothing. What was the significance of Fort Sumter to the Charleston Harbor? Okay. All right. Well, then let me kind of address that for you. Fort Moultrie sat over in the corner. Fort Moultrie had been involved in the Revolutionary War. Fort Moultrie did not cover the entrance to the harbor. Fort Sumter did. So, and also very telling was that Fort Sumter was at the revenue collection point for shipping in and out of the harbor. Begin to make any more sense now? Okay, question number five. How many casualties were the result of the bombardment of Fort Sumter by the Confederate forces? Zero. Sarge, you are right again. Well, I'm a good guesser. <laughs> yes. Zero casualties. Now, the next day... After they surrendered, one of the Union forces in an accident was killed. Didn't have anything to do with the Confederacy. But there was a casualty the day after the uh, uh, Major Anderson capitulated. 
Okay, were these Union forces at Fort Sumter made prisoners of war, or were they released? They were released, weren't they? Yes, they were all released. They were not only released, but they were provided transportation back into the North by the Confederacy. Okay, question number where, seven. Is that where the phrase "no good deed goes unpunished" came from? Yes, that that <laughs> was that would certainly fit in there, Sarge, without a doubt. Okay, did Abraham Lincoln order an armed attack on Fort Pickens at Pensacola on March the thirty first, eighteen sixty one? No answers. No guesses. Hmm. Yes. Well, I'll guess yes. Yes. Well, uh, that is a very good guess, Cal, because you would be correct. Mm -hmm. He did order in secret orders. He ordered an attack on Fort Pickens two weeks before uh, two weeks before Fort Sumter was fired upon. But the interesting thing is that one Union soldier stopped that armed attack on Fort Pickens by stating that they were under an armistice which had been signed under the previous president to not initiate any hostile actions unless the Confederacy began, unless the Confederacy instigated the first one. So okay, he's talking, so he's talking about President Buchanan then, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. The previous Buchanan, president, okay. Yeah. Okay, here's a here's a good question. Does one president have to adhere to an arm, armistice that was signed by the previous president? Yes. Natu naturally, Lincoln said he didn't. I know Murr is a did, great... Trump did the same thing with the Iran thing, didn't he? Uh, With that, very, very so similar. Speak. Very similar. Uh, moving to question eight, what is the significance of Fort Barrancas? Uh, Murr does some great research. Murr, have you found anything about Fort Barrancas yet? No, I didn't think we were allowed to search, so I'm just listening. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I didn't tell you you weren't allowed to search. But you, you throw up some uh, some great stuff from time to time. But Fort Barrancas, the Confederate forces were actually fired upon by the Union soldiers at Fort Barrancas prior to. Didn't amount to much, but they were actually physically fired upon, and that is documented in the Library of Congress. Okay, so the Confederacy did not fire the first shots in anger. Okay, jumping ahead here. Who was placed in command of Confederate forces in 1861? About 98% of the people get this wrong. Any answers? Uh, the 98 probably said Lee. Yes, you would be right, and that would be the wrong answer. <laughs> uh when the Battle of First Manassas occurred, uh, Robert E. Lee was in what is now West Virginia, hmm. with commanding a group of forces there. He was not at First Manassas whatsoever. He was made commander-in-chief after the wounding of Joseph E. Johnson, who was had, in essence, co-command of the Confederate forces with none other than Pierre Gouffston Toutant Beauregard, PGT Beauregard. PGT Beauregard was the Confederate commander who ordered the firing on Fort Sumter. So I've given away the answer partially to question 10. In the Battle of First Manassas or First Bull Run, who were the opposing commanders? We've got Johnson does in it on the on the uh, Confederacy and Beauregard in the Confederacy, both of whom were there. Who was the Union commander? Uh, 
come on, folks. He had a, he had a, uh, <laughs> he actually had a, <laughs> actually had a saddle named after him. Sarge, you ought to get this one. Ooh, a saddle named after him. Boy, I'm drawing a blank. Hmm. George McClellan. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Interesting. A McClellan saddle. And huh? George, George McClellan was, uh, he is really a good study because he kept telling. He was ordered to attack, to attack, to attack, to attack by Lincoln and others. And he kept telling Lincoln that uh, his uh, intel told him that the Confederates had an army of over 100,000 men ready to fight, which was false. But it's kind of fun when you get into it. Wow. Number 11, whose military strategy was most responsible for the Confederate victory at First Manassas? Any answers? Beauregard? That would have been... No, pardon me? Someone Beauregard? had an answer? Beauregard? No. Nope. Beauregard was pretty inept when it came to military strategy. Mm -hmm. The Confederate victory at First Manassas, uh, the strategy, because almost immediately, there was one Confederate commander who saw two things which had changed since the war in Mexico. Number one is he saw the effects of rifled muskets as opposed to smoothbore muskets as far as accuracy was concerned. And he saw that people were becoming killed in larger numbers because of the accuracy of these. And then he therefore told his men to go into the prone position when firing with the people behind them in a kneeling position. And then as soon as the people in the kneeling position had reloaded their single shot muskets, they would go into the prone position. The prone position would back up and they would go into a kneeling position and start their reloading. Yeah. That was Stonewall Jackson. Yep. I had Jackson written down, but when you gave the other answers, I didn't think he was there. <laughs> Yeah, Jackson, Jackson was most definitely there, and uh, had it not been for Jackson's strategy and his brilliant military expertise, the Confederacy might very well have lost First Manassas. But then Jackson wanted to pursue the Union Army back into Washington, D.C. and demand a surrender, but he was stopped by a member of the Confederate cabinet, which we will get into later. What battle strategy was offered to General Lee and President Jeff Davis on multiple occasions, but was rejected on five different occasions? I put down every time, but five different occasions. So anyone have any idea what that strategy was? DW? Ending the war quickly. <laughs> well, Ending it quickly. Well, that is precise in some respects because Stonewall Jackson went to both uh, President Jefferson Davis and to um, Robert E. Lee on five separate occasions early on in the war and said, look, we cannot win a prolonged war. The Confederacy does not have the mechanization. We do not have we, we don't have any cannon manufacturers. We don't have any uh, manufacturers for firearms. We are pretty well having to deal with what we've got. We cannot win a prolonged war, so we must become the aggressors, and we must move immediately in to shut off, must move into Maryland, because there we have tons of allies. We move into Maryland, and we shut off the U.S. Capitol, because the Capitol could not be accessed by any rail or anything else except traveling through Maryland. And yet, Stonewall was rejected on those particular points of interest, much to the chagrin of what we later became. 
Well, in the Peninsula Campaign, what Confederate cavalry commander actually rode a circle around the Union Army? And I didn't include it in the question, but the Union Army contained his father-in-law. So he led a, he rode all the way around them, proving early on in the war the supremacy of the Confederate soldier, especially the Confederate member of cavalry. So does anyone well, know? Was, Go ahead. That was in the movie. That was in the movie Dances with Wolves. It was Kevin Costner. Uh, <laughs> really? I'm sorry. <laughs> was it you Stuart? Follow? Who said Stuart? Rick? Yeah. You'd be correct. Jeb Stuart. Jonathan Edward Brown Stewart. Jeb Stewart. Okay, question number 14. Who was Stonewall Jackson's cavalry leader during the early Valley Campaign? No answers. Probably a gentleman who was terribly, terribly distraught early on in the war because he had lost his brother charging beside him, charging a Union position. His brother had been killed, and this Confederate cavalry commander, this general, was a brilliant military strategist and tactician, and unfortunately, the Confederacy lost him, and his name would be Turner Ashby. Number 15. Which federal commander did Abraham Lincoln order to put down the rebellion of the Santee Sioux in Minnesota in 1862? Oh, Any I guesses, know. thoughts? It's on the tip of my tongue, and I can't remember the guy's name. Ooh. Custer. Say again, someone said something. Custer. Uh, no. no. Sheridan. Nope. Sherman. Nope. Nope. Oh, well. Grant. Nope. Mm. This general had just gotten his butt kicked at Second Manassas. So Lincoln sent him to go kill Indians. McClellan? No, John Pope. Pope. P O P E. John Pope. And there is a very comical story about. Pope, when Pope re received command to move in the Battle of Second Manassas from Abraham Lincoln, he sent Abraham Lincoln a communique back which said, rest assured, Mr. President, that from henceforth my headquarters will be in the saddle, to which Stonewall Jackson responded, well, this ought to be fun because he's got his headquarters where his hindquarters ought to be. In other words, he's got rectal cranial inversion. <laughs> yes. I don't think Stonewall knew that phrase, uh, Jim. But uh, <laughs> but uh, what did uh, General Pope, when he was given that task, what did he say about the Santee Sioux? He intended to kill them all, which is the reason in many instances that he went in and just did a blanket arrest of any Indian that he found and they put them on trial, 130 some of them. Each one of them received a 10 minute trial. They were all sentenced to death. But Abraham Lincoln was afraid that if it got to Europe that he had executed that many American Indians that uh, Europe might not react kindly to that and he was terribly worried about uh, uh, the European countries coming in on the side of the Confederacy. So he ordered that number be whittled down to 39. So Abraham Lincoln ordered the largest mass execution of American Indians in the history of America, especially since probably very few of them were not guilty. Hey, Mike. Sir, go ahead. Jeff Stewart's name was James Ewell Brown, not Jonathan Edward, whatever you said. Jonathan Ewell Brown. Thank you. I said Edward. It was Jonathan Ewell Brown. You are correct. And thank you, Rick, for that uh, no, correction. James, James Ewell Brown. James Ewell Brown? Hmm. Okay. 
All right. Well, I'll check my sources, but I think you are correct there. But uh, I, I probably misspoke. But J.E.B. James Ewell Brown. Yes, that sounds correct. So thank you for the correction, sir. What Cherokee chief wrote his people's reasons for siding with the Confederacy, quoting the Declaration of Independence? Anyone know? It's a great read, folks. It is an absolute great read. And the Confederate, I mean, the uh, chief of the Cherokee Indians was John Ross. I hope I get that one right, Rick. John Ross. And his response was killer. Uh, it's one of the best responses ever when asked why that the Cherokees chose to side with the Confederacy instead of the Union. Okay, question 18. In Lincoln's first inaugural address, what reason did he provide for which he would invade the southern states? It's actually there in the first inaugural address. Anyone have an answer? He said he would. Mm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That got garbled. I think he said, I'm an idiot. Nice. Nah, I don't think that was it. Preserve the union. To preserve no, the union. it was to collect revenue or taxes. Ah, Cal, you got it right. I will invade those states to, uh, to affect the collection of our revenues. And, of course, he said that he would not do anything to interfere with slavery because slavery was constitutional. And therefore, he would not tamper with it whatsoever, but he would invade to collect the revenue. And that's exactly what he did. Well, it was because of those unfair collection of revenues that the South seceded in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the, the war for Southern independence was a, just a big tax revolt. Yes. Wasn't well, about would be slavery. It's a tax revolt, people, like you know, American people do. Yep. Well, who was the author of the Corwin Amendment, which was passed by both houses of Congress and then sent to the states for ratification, where three states ratified before Fort Sumter was followed, uh, fired upon? Pardon me. Corwin and Lincoln. Corwin. Oh, really? Where was he from? Don't know that one. Illinois. Ohio. Ooh. Oh. But did Corwin actually write it? That's what I'm thinking Lincoln did. And you would be correct, Sarge. Uh, that was revealed in a letter which was found in Philadelphia just something over 15 years ago. Going through some documents in Philadelphia, they actually found that. Wow. So, and uh, I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, Godwin, Godwin something. She wrote a, uh, uh, a novel or a story, a history book about Lincoln. And she uh, revealed that as well in her book, citing that find in Philadelphia. Kern's good one. Thanks, Brent. You nailed it, buddy. That is her name. And uh, what'd she call the title of her book? Have you got that handy there, Brent? No, I don't. Okay. But that was the correct answer, sir. Okay. What was Lincoln's response to Chief Justice Roger Tawney stating Lincoln's ignoring of the act of habeas corpus was in fact illegal and unconstitutional? He issued an arrest warrant for the for the justice. Yes, he did. But uh, that was also found in that same search of documents that was actually found because uh, all of the Lincoln apologists has de had denied that for over a century that that was in fact true. But that evidence was also found in a cache of documents in Pennsylvania that in effect 
He ordered an arrest warrant, but it was the U.S. Marshal Service which refused to serve it. Oh, that book was Team of Rivals. Oh, oh. thank you, Mur. Team of Rivals. Thank you very much. This old brain's getting old. I can't remember everything I want to remember anymore. Uh, like uh, Jeb Stewart's name. But, but thanks, thanks, to, thank, thanks, thanks, thanks to this to group, we were able to do it. Mike, you've forgotten, or you have probably have forgotten more than we all even know. So don't feel bad about it. Amen. Well, I, <laughs> I do when I forget stuff. It, it bothers me. But then I read... Uh, the letter from uh, Thomas Jefferson to John Adams talking about getting old and I don't feel so bad anymore. Okay, question 21. What is the importance of the legal case called Ex Parte Merriman? No comments? Merriman was the gentleman who was ordered arrested for having Confederate sympathies. And so the uh, legal case came about, ex parte Merriman. So you can please look that up and see what you find on that. I think you will find it most enlightening. I would rather you look it up than me tell you because you are more likely to remember it if you look it up. 22, which Confederate general, who was actually an up-and-coming general with a lot of great, uh, what would we call it, uh, potential. He was killed early in the Battle of Shiloh. Can anyone name him? Now, I think I remember this one right, Rick. Correct me if I'm wrong. Albert Sidney Johnson. And how many of you have ever heard anything about him? Shot through the leg and actually bled to death. Very early in the battle. Femoral artery. Yes. Number 23. What Confederate general was known as the Wizard of the Saddle? Would that be Forrest? Yeah, Nathan Bedford Forrest. MBF. Yes. Yes, we got that one right. Great, great job, guys. Number 24, and this one is most significant. Under what circumstances did Stonewall Jackson... Ah, first day with my new mouth. What Under what circumstances did Stonewall Jackson submit his resignation in 1862? How many of you knew he submitted his resignation in 1862? I, I remember knew. hearing it, but I, I've heard the thing, but I can't remember what it was. He, he requested what? arms and received pikes. Yeah. That would be correct. He That's requested it. arms for his soldiers in the Valley right Campaign, camp. and he requested those arms from whom and who sent him pikes? Well, Judy P. Benjamin. Ah, D.W., you got it. <laughs> yes, the wonderful gentleman that Stonewall Jackson referred to as President, uh, <laughs> the president's favorite Jew. Or his, uh, yeah, his pet Jew. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. He was, um, also, he was also in command. He was also the one as Secretary of War who halted Stonewall Jackson from going into Washington D.C. after the ignominious defeat of the Confederate of the uh, Federals at uh, the Battle of First Manassas. Was that Pickett's you said or no? That got the pike. No. no. Okay, I always want to remember it that way. Oh, and no. and you said Johnson or Johnston? It was Johnston anyway. Okay. Well. Uh, my southern dialect allows me to skip over T's from time to time, sweetheart. Well, since I know nothing, I can nitpick. <laughs> You're fine, Murr. You nitpick all well, you now, want to. John Stun was in the Battle of Atlanta, wasn't he? It was, so it had oh, to be yes. John's son. 
Well, they I've seen spellings both ways, Rick. I've seen spellings in uh, actual Confederate documents that had John Son and John Stun. I've seen both. So I'm not actually sure which one it was. But uh, he uh, and uh, to, to my mind, if you really do a, a deep research into the Battle of Atlanta, which I have done and actually walked the ground and I uh, took a uh, summer vacation one time to go from Chattanooga to Atlanta following the trail as uh, he advanced on Atlanta and the uh, resistance that was offered. And uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting the things that you will see if you, you know, if you go into and start doing those things. But that was the reason he submitted his resignation. Now, Jefferson Davis almost immediately sent members of Congress, especially two members of Congress from Virginia, to uh, go immediately to Stonewall Jackson to get him to change his mind about his resignation, which he did. Now, here's a great question. Who was the most competent general from either side and who was the most incompetent? Cite example as to your belief. Anyone want to run with that? Cal, DW? I got an answer. All right, let's hear it, Rick. <clears throat> McClellan was the most incompetent one, I think, because Lincoln got so frustrated with him for not wanting to fight. Uh, that's why he appointed Grant. Yes, but he made uh, he actually made McClellan commander twice. Because uh, for some reason, McClellan's men loved him. The second time he terminated McClellan, he put Grant in charge of the army. And when he was told that, and this is official, when he was told that Grant was a chronic alcoholic, Lincoln's response was, well, find barrels of whatever whiskey he is drinking and deliver it to my other generals. Robert E. Lee. For, uh, Joan, um, did you think for, Lee was co competent or incompetent? Incompetent because he made the same mistake of the, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but uh, let, his, let his men be fired upon from the, the ones on top of the hill. And he made well, the same mistake that he saw the other uh, Union, I guess, uh, general make <laughs> something like that. Well, Joan, a very good answer because Lee was commanding the Confederate forces at the Battle of Fredericksburg in late, in uh, actually it was December of 1862, and he had the high ground and he noticed that his artillery was just chewing the Confederacy, I mean, the Union Army to pieces of course burnside was an idiot anyway but i may have given away another incompetent union general but burnside was charging up that hill and that is when lee made that famous comment it is well that war is so terrible or we should all grow too fond of it but yet at gettysburg and at seven pines he did exactly the same thing right so he was a great moral man in many respects, but I do not count him as a strategist or a military genius by any reason. And he made the comment after Stonewall Jackson had had his right arm amputated. He, uh, my left arm amputated, I'm sorry. He made, uh, Robert E. Lee made the comment uh, Jackson has lost his left arm. I have lost my right. So uh, I am not a fan of Robert E. Lee's military expertise, but his, as a Christian gentleman, he I hold him in the highest respect. Right. Well, this is a it's a this is an example of this is an example of a military man fighting the last war. He's using, he's using 
strategies and tactics from Napoleonic and in previous wars. <clears throat> and my, my uh, aside, we, a quick aside, Burnside might have been an incompetent, but he does get style points. Yes. Aside burn. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. Uh, what was his uh, classic blunder, Brent, at uh, the Battle of uh, Shepherds, Shepherdstown, or as uh, Yankees call it, Antietam? I didn't, I don't recall that. I was young when I read what I did. Well, at uh, Shepherdstown, or, uh, you know, what we call Antietam, he, there was a bridge across a uh, body of water, and he kept trying to force his troops across that to attack the Confederates, and the Confederate sharpshooters just kept shooting his horses and shooting his men as they started across and kept blocking the bridge. The crazy thing about it was is the creek wasn't even knee-deep, and he didn't know it. Wow. My, my understanding of Lee's strengths was he was good uh, at uh, logistics organization, getting things to where they should be, when they should be on time, and such like that. Well, yes, he was. He was very adept at that. He just, uh, those uh, classic mistakes, I mean, you know, he saw uh, the Union Army do it at, both at Fredericks, Fredericksburg, and he saw them also do them at uh, Mechanicsville. He saw the he saw the Union Army just get massacred and their men just uh, almost completely wiped out in charges. And then he did the same thing at Gettysburg. Of course, there was a classic confrontation between Longstreet and Lee the night before the battle. Because Lee uh, Longstreet thought that charging across that open field was suicide and he told Lee as much. And he kept standing by his position, and he did so to the point that Lee finally pounded on the table, which was uncharacteristic of Lee. And he pointed to the map, and he said, the enemy is there. We will attack there. But what Longstreet wanted to do was a flanking movement around Little Round Top to envelop the Union Army, which was the, almost the exact same tactic that Stonewall Jackson had made uh, into a great victory at Chancellorsville. So one wonders why. And then, of course, the next day, after the charge, a uh, picket's charge, and uh oh, my signal's bad. Bad. Point yeah, action. I might be getting some. Yeah, might be getting some weather there. Hey, DW. Yeah, bud. You, you talked about the, you know, the Napoleonic type of warfare, which, you know, <laughs> Napoleon was just following, you know, previous warfare of what it was. And you know, warfare, you know, before the before the Industrial Revolution, it was basically, you know, hand to hand, you know, swords and pikes and, you know, the hoplite armies and the phalanx and all that. So warfare was different. In the Industrial Revolution, which brought about a more mechanized military, um, in the ways of old, it was what was called the cult of offensive, to where you took the initiative towards them. And that's what they were trained at back in West Point, because they hadn't quite caught up to modern warfare. I mean, this continued all the way into the First World War, where you had the trenches, and they just attacked trenches. They, you know, it became, that was what the cult, it was, from what I understand from military historians, it was called the cult of offensive. You took the offensive to the enemy. That's why Lee would say, the enemy is there, we will go there and attack you. Just, just to but, put kind of a perspective on it. Okay, Cal, nice job. Is anyone familiar with a uh, Confederate uh, soldier by the name of John Singleton Mosby? I've heard the name. Mm. John Singleton Mosby operated within eyesight of Washington, D.C. for the better part of two years. 
probably one of the greatest stories from the Civil War. He actually took, or our Second War for Independence, pardon me, he actually took some, uh, some of his men and actually invaded, I, I shouldn't say invaded, they didn't do it with force, but they walked into a Union camp in the middle of the night, and one of the wonderful stories is Mosby walks up to a general who's asleep in his cot, and he takes his sword, and he slaps this general right across his backside. And the general jumps up, stares around, and Mosby says, General, have you ever heard of John Singleton Mosby? And the general said, No. Have you captured him? And Mosby says, No, sir, but he has captured you. And he took him as a prisoner of war. But Mosby saw as Jackson did, Mosby saw that to win this war, considering all of the parameters, the only way to win this war was through guerrilla warfare. And that's what he did. That's why he was able to operate within view of Washington, D.C. for two years. Robert E. Lee would not promote him to general because he said the art of guerrilla warfare was unmanly. That also, in my book, is a strike against Lee. But if we get to the commanders who were incompetent, in my mind, on either side, no one was more incompetent than General Braxton Bragg of the Confederacy. He lost battles that I, I just don't see how physically he lost those battles. One would be Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. If you've ever been on Lookout Mountain and looked down off of Lookout Mountain at the Tennessee River and where you were looking down on the Union forces, how he ever allowed the Union forces to drive him off that mountain is beyond my comprehension. And then at the Battle of Stones River, he took Nathan Bedford Forrest's troops and got them pretty well annihilated. And at the end of the battle, Nathan Bedford Forrest rides up to Braxton Bragg, takes off his gauntlet, slaps him through the face and says, General, should I ever meet you again on the field of battle, I will kill you. But Braxton Bragg was a friend of Jefferson Davis. They were members of the elite. They were members of the gentry. And therefore, his incompetence didn't matter. So even on the side of the Confederacy, we have some huge issues there. Comments, please. Who would you say was the most competent? Jackson? I think uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest was the most competent, okay. uh, but uh, it would be a close toss-up between he, he and Stonewall, uh, because if you've ever read or studied the Valley Campaign, here was Stonewall Jackson going up and down the Shenandoah Valley in 1862 with about thirty to 35,000 troops, and he was confronted by three Union forces that amounted to over 100,000 troops. Shields Bank and Fremont, Banks and Fremont, and he kicked their butts up and down the valley for a year, just absolutely outmaneuvered them time after time after time. But then I've often wondered many times in looking at this through military strategy, what would have been the difference? I don't think there would have ever been a march to the sea by Sherman if Forrest had been in command instead of Braxton Bragg. And the, um, I'm trying to think of the battle now, it's uh, given me a, a brain cramp. But there was one battle in particular where uh, Forrest was outnumbered three to one and just through sheer military genius was able to prevail, even with that kind of numbers. So, cool. Jim, to my mind, it would have been a toss-up between uh, Forrest and Stonewall. I do believe, had Stonewall been 
still alive and had been at Gettysburg, I believe the outcome of that battle would have been much different. Number one is the guy who had taken over Stonewall's unit, uh, Ewell. They called him Old Baldy. He, when he went into Gettysburg, he did not take the high ground. He rested his troops instead of forcing his troops, moving them like Stonewall would have done to seize the high ground, which was called Seminary Ridge. Instead of taking the high ground, Ewell went into bivouac at the bottom of the mountain. And during the night, George Meade took the high ground, Ew. which which later on proved just absolutely a, a, a terrible uh, defeat for the Confederacy. Uh, any other thoughts, please, folks? We are rapidly running out of that first hour. But as the bonus question, what is the logical difference between the Revolutionary Army attack on Fort Ticonderoga and the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter? Now, I'm asking you to bring your knowledge of two different battles in two different eras into play here. So does anyone want to jump out and try to answer that question? Hmm. I'm guessing that my coach wasn't the only one that was really, really boring. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, they, does it, they both involved shipping. Yes, they did. Uh, and it was a uh, very, uh, it was crucial to the point. Does anyone know the, uh, revolutionary, uh, general who took Fort Ticonderoga? Was Knox, wasn't it? Nope. Washington? Nope. Hmm. Was it Green? Green was involved, but he wasn't the guy who came up with the strategy and the move. Has anyone ever heard of Benedict Arnold? Oh, yeah. <laughs> This was before he became famous. Huh? <laughs> right. And uh, it's my belief that Green took all of the credit, and that was one of the things that began to uh, really uh, play on Benedict Arnold's mind. Uh, Benedict Arnold, uh, Washington believed, was one of his best battlefield leaders, and I think he was correct. But uh, so there we have, we've done our 26 questions. And so now we are into our second hour. So uh, do we want to go into any kind of discussion or any kind of questions on this? Or does someone want to take us in a different yeah. direction? I would like to ask a question. All right, Gary. Good to see you, buddy. You too, Mike. What was the justification that the uh, rulers of South Carolina used in in starting the the war, I mean, why well, did they succeed? What was their justification? Are you uh, making the assumption that South Carolina started the war? No, I'm just saying that you know, weren't they the first to succeed? Yes, they were. They were the first to secede. Okay, I'm asking, what justification did they use for that decision? <clears throat> the House, the Senate, whatever was in place at that time. Didn't someone say taxes? Well, that was what Lincoln used to justify his side of the war. But what justification did South Carolina use to secede? Would it be the same thing? Mike? <laughs> Constitution. Mike, did we, we might have lost Mike. Yeah, evidently we did. Yeah, he's got a bad <clears throat> signal again. And there he went. Uh, Gary, I believe that South Carolina was saying because because of the imbalance of the taxes. South Carolina was paying a huge amount of taxes, and they weren't getting anything for it. The North was, and they just said, we're done with this. This doesn't work. And to a greater point, 
Um, secession is the liberty to associate or disassociate. So basically, you don't have to have a reason to secede. You can just say, I secede because I want to. If you look at it from a truly rights or rightful liberty standpoint, you don't even have to. It's the same reason why I have guns. I don't have to explain to you why. <laughs> I don't have to have a reason why other than I want them. Well, the second, so, uh, also look, guys, at the point of uh, you talk about secession. Uh, uh, heck, the founding of this country was a secession. The Declaration of Independence was a move for secession. So how did it become suddenly when uh, other people are seceding from a government for the same reason? Why is one legal and the other is not? Okay, then I've got one more question, Mike, if I may. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Did the South deliberately lose? Uh, no. I don't think that was ever in the minds of the South to deliberately lose. The, uh, I'm not saying, I, guess, I just guess I didn't clarify that enough, Mike. Okay. Is, was leadership of the South encouraged to deliberately lose? Oh, and Judah I'll P. Benjamin? You, Yes, and I, that's one yes. main reason why I'm coming to that conclusion is because some of the actions and stuff that I've studied and, or even listening to you say there might have been some subversive people that uh, wanted the South to lose but would play acting on the South side. No, oh, I, 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 I have no I, doubt about that, Gary. Uh, sorry, uh, Cal, go ahead. No, no, I, I mean, in doing the same thing, I've come to the same wonderment and you know it did the south lose how much of this was much like the revolutionary war i mean it was judah p benjamin that stopped them from chasing the union army back into dc and that would have ended the war so did they try to actually end the war or was it like well we can't end the war now because well, we haven't made enough money on it yet and i'm speaking of the money man because um i haven't found it but it sure seems like the money men were involved in creating this war, just like they created the Revolutionary War. I'm seeing well, guys, a lot of the same patterns. Here's a question. Exactly. Here's what a question. I see is came out of that war. That's what I see. That you know, the results to me indicate the actions that were taken during that war about what come out afterwards. I mean, the Thirteenth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and all these other unconstitutional amendments and some of the legislation and it just there's a lot of things that come out of that war that without that war would have not been possible and i think that's an astute observation on that point but if uh, i go no further than this if you're secretary of war and one of your best battlefield commanders is engaged in forces that are three times his number in the Shenandoah Valley. And he requests new arms for his soldiers because the majority of soldiers are carrying squirrel rifles and what have you from home. When he requests new weapons and the secretary of war sends him wooden pikes, do you need a more definitive answer than that? Well, that's my point. And then two, if I've studied, not so in depth, but I've studied World War I and World War II and the different actions that's been taken by the supposed good guys, there's a certain end that always comes out of those, at least those two wars, um, that doesn't benefit us or us as a country in World War I or World War II. So, and it just seems like the same technique has been repeated from civil war world war one and world war two because it works I, and that's my point yes and then also i think another thing that most people probably unaware of history and again uh you know uh, jim and i only know one coach who may have taught the truth in history class and we we met him and he was wearing a kilt wasn't he jim he certainly was, and don't forget, D.W. knows him, too. 
Oh yes, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, he he met the the coach as well. But uh, here is the point I think so many people forget is that wars are bankers' wars. All wars are meant to be extended as long as possible. That is why no one other than John McCain said we need to fight this war if it takes a hundred years against the Middle East. And then he was over in the Middle East uh, providing them with weapons to fight us with. So hmm. they are all bankers wars and they are there and they are extended for as long as the people will tolerate it. I mean, you, you know, I firmly believe that, uh, and I think the evidence is there to indicate that uh, Nixon finally something about Vietnam just finally got to him and then he, he wanted to end the war. And I believe that they fabricated Watergate to get him out of there. Yeah. Because he, he had gone against well, he had gone against the bankers. I want to. Well, don't I want to one of the, Well, hang on. One of the things too, don't forget that Kennedy was against the Vietnam War. Well, Kennedy had issued an order bringing all of the troops home within one year, and the first presidential move by uh, LBJ, even on the plane before they even left Dallas, was to rescind that order. And then if you go to the Library of Congress and look at that order, that order was written the day before the assassination. My point exactly. Okay, Gary. So uh, you, w. Oh, and I have that disc for that book in the, somebody's hands that I hope can crack the code on it. Well, we'll, we'll, all, be, we'll all be the benefit of that. Let me give well, you. A, not, let me give you. Something. I've got another. I've got another friend. Well, actually, Gina does, but um, that, who's a PhD in computer science, and if the guy I give it to now can't crack it, I'm pretty sure that other guy can. Yeah. <laughs> well, fingers uh, crossed. We'll all look. Forward, we'll all look forward to it. Here's a. In order to, uh, you know, give you some substance to what you're talking about, Gary, and, and Mike, and uh, about the conversation as to the disposition of funds after the war. Okay. Uh, what, who, who was, who was the, uh, I, I refer to him as the repo man. After the Civil War, who was the repo man? Well, the repo man was the North. Uh, did they recover uh, material goods and wealth in order to pay uh, down their debt. Yeah. Did the uh, people that had invested in American war bonds uh, for the North, uh, did they get repaid? Who were the people that invested in American war debt for the North? Uh, so if you go, uh, I mentioned this earlier, this very same book earlier today. Uh, it's uh, Alexander Del Mar. It's called A History of Monetary Crimes. And if you go to page 75, he, he covers extensively and in detail the crime of 1868 and the war bonds, American war bonds that were uh, to be paid for uh, and who paid for them. And uh, what you find is that uh, the big investors were uh, European, European banking syndicate was the uh, owner of the largest amount of those bonds. And they were to be payable back in greenbacks, but the crime of 1868 made them payable uh, in specie, in gold. Well, DW, and uh, that's, uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. What no, I was no. going to say, has anyone else also thought of, here was something else, and I read about this recently, and it was, absolutely mind-boggling in some ways, but then it was no surprise, was that after the Civil War, the Union set up a pension plan for all Union veterans. Now, some Southern Confederate veterans got pensions, but their pensions were paid by their individual states. They were not paid by the federal government. The 14th Amendment says that they can't be paid that they're not to be paid, their debts are not to be covered. But yet, from 1868 until early 
hatred. Now, you want to talk about tying the people to debt from war. How much money was paid to Union War veterans until the last one passed away? What was the total amount? It was like $4 billion, wasn't it? A little over it five, the, Gary. Yeah, it was over, in the Bs. I knew, I knew it yeah. was in the billion. And the, hey, war, and the war itself, the war itself cost two billion so they were able to tie the american taxpayer to a continual debt with those pensions well, mike in that vein let me ask now i've read somewhere you know i'm an avid reader like dw but uh correct me if i'm wrong and i can't back this up because i don't remember where i read it at but in our agreement, our treaties with the United Nations, that we're supposed to furnish the military arm for the United Nations. And then on top of that, we're supposed to pay for it, the American taxpayer. Now, yes. I know I've read that. I know I've read that, but I can't remember where I read it. That was established at the end of World War I, League of Nations, which became the United Nations. Well, the, my, my hypothesis there is the League of Nations slash United Nations never went away. And right. I, based that on, I based that on the orders I've seen in the published in his book with Major Jordan's diaries. Yeah, and, and now, they're now they're just called NATO. Yeah. I, I got a well, statement that probably covers all the wars we fought. Uh, this And this statement is, of course, you would appreciate this, Mike, backed up by many a reference. And it's from Ron Gibson's book, The Land Patent Book, things that people don't know about this country. He said, America is a British colony. The United States is a corporation, not a landmass, and it existed before the Revolutionary War, and the British troops did not leave until 1796. And he quotes uh, that from Republica versus Swears, 1 Dallas 43, Treaty of Commerce, 8 Stat 116, Treaty of Peace, 8 Stat 80, IRS Publication 6209, and Articles Association, October 20th, 1774. But why did the uh, king's forces refuse to leave the U.S., although it was in the Treaty of Paris? Why did they leave? I don't know. Well, because that, that was the enforcement arm for the... Uh what was it, the East India Company or the West India Company? I forget which. Well, in many respects, that's why they were there. But what was the excuse they used? Go ahead. Because in the Treaty of Paris, the U.S. was to return the lands to the loyalists. They were to return their lands, which had been seized during the war. And, of course, when the treaty was signed, they knew that was never going to happen because people had bought those properties. Those properties had gone through two or three hands by then. They knew that those properties were not going to all be returned. The guy who, as an attorney, fought against the recovery of these properties more than anyone else was that good old guy from Maryland named Luther Martin. He had case after case after case after case in Maryland, a great study, where he said, no, we do not have to return these lands. These lands were taken in war, and they were taken from people who supported our enemy. So, no, we don't have to pay them back. So, But uh, the Crown said, look, if you're not going to fulfill your treaty, we're not going to fulfill ours. So they left the troops here until almost 1800, like you alluded to, Gary. Well, why did they leave then? Well, that is a good question, Murr, uh, because maybe the government that they wanted established was in place after Reconstruction. No, I'm sorry. Reconstruction. I have wars there. Pardon me. Uh, maybe by 1796, 1798, that they believed that they were in control of the monetary system. I'm sorry. I jumped wars there. My bad. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, uh, talking about Reconstruction and 
reparations. Wasn't there a whole lot of gold on a ship that supposedly sank? That was supposed to go to the south? Are you talking about, yes, that was true, but are you talking about the Confederate Treasury? I don't know, I guess. <laughs> when, uh, when Jefferson Davis left Richmond, uh, when the siege was coming, and Jefferson Davis left, and this is after Appomattox Courthouse, he left, and he and Judah P. Benjamin are carrying the Confederate Treasury, which was all gold. Carrying that in wagons as they moved south, and they wanted to get that those funds to General Joe Jackson. Uh, I, I hope I got that name right. I'm having a name thing today. But Joe Johnson, maybe it was, but it wasn't the same Johnson. There was another one who was in Mexico, and uh, a Confederate general, and he wanted to get the money to him. And so somewhere near Abbeville, South Carolina, they split up because the Union forces were closing in on them. And uh, Jefferson Davis told Judah P. Benjamin to take the money and to try to get it to uh, the Confederacy, the remnants of the Confederacy in Mexico. And, of course, he took the gold. And we're not sure where he actually caught a ship, but he took the gold and went to Europe with it. Yeah. Well, and lived, yeah, lived he, very handsomely ever since. He, well, well if there's, you find yeah, it, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Uh, if you finance he, uh, both he, sides of a conflict, it doesn't matter who wins, does it? No, not as long as it lasts long enough, you know, because perpetual war, this thing we're doing now, perpetual war for perpetual peace. Does anyone want to go back to 9-11 and move forward to today and tell me how many billions of dollars have gone into our military fighting wars they can't win? Well, first of all, it's not our military, but I take your point. Judah P. Benjamin, Judah P. Benjamin catches a ship out of uh, Florida, transfers in the to another ship in the uh, Caribbean from their sails in a uh, British man of war to uh, London and spends the rest of his life at the highest level of judiciary in the King's Court for uh, Britain. Okay. Uh, this this is a big deal. I mean, you know, what more what more evidence do you need that you have a, a du duplicitous British Jew that's infiltrated the South and you know is working his own game, you know, for somebody? He's an agent. So, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they keep saying, "Well, where's the Confederate gold? Where's the Confederate gold?" Well, it, it ask the Queen of England. That's the city of London where it's at. That's where yeah, it's at. Where, That's where Daryl, where did where did he retire to? He went right back to where he well, was. Well, no, I just told, told you. To. I just yeah, <laughs> I just told you, right? He yeah. he retired he retired to uh the the king's judiciary and spent the rest of his life in that until he died. Okay. So who was there. he working for? Okay. And how much All trouble right. did he cause Duh. from there? <laughs> well, he I mean, was he the got fox his, in the hen house. Yeah. He got he got his he received his his benefit, okay. So he got his benefit out of it, you know. Oh yes, uh, and let's not forget they, he left his family. He left his family yeah, and well, never went back to him. It didn't mean well, anything. Well, you, know, you know, didn't mean anything. You to gotta, you're you're placing you're projecting your morals on them. <laughs> so, Mike, I got another one. I'd like yeah. to get your input on. Yes, sir. Go. Um, this is uh, comes out of Messages and Papers of the Presidents, Volume 1, page 99, the 1828 Dictionary of Estates. Military, George Washington divided up the states, parentheses, estates, into districts. Yeah. Okay. Your question? Oh, well. Did he was he not just acting in the king's stead there to put these estates in places that weren't really even the states united? Well, 
You know, I, there are so many questions there, and that's a great question. And one of the questions I've always had was the Redcoats had a huge army in New York under Clinton. And Clinton sat there and let Yorktown happen without raising a hand to help Cornwallis. Why did he do that? Mm. And and today they say that New York City belongs to the UN. At Mayor, Mayor Giuliani actually said that publicly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the UN is the international law, which is protecting this criminal thing from from getting hammered by the people. Well, guys, let me throw out something, and uh, this may be totally off the wall. I have no confirmation of this whatsoever. But one of my sources called me a couple of days ago and said that while when Biden was in Mexico, that Trudeau was actually there as well, and that the president of Mexico, Biden and Trudeau, signed an agreement to make it the North American Union and to take down all borders. And Mike, I heard the same thing. So I'm beginning to wonder that uh, that confirmation, Gary, thank you for that, because I had, hadn't had any confirmation, anything whatsoever. But I'm going to tell you, I do not put that above these people at all. Mike, say that again real quick, please. Well, uh, while in Mexico, Trudeau was there, Biden was there, and the president of Mexico, I can't even remember his name, they signed an agreement to make this the North American Union and to take down all borders between the countries and to put us all on the same governing system. Now, I'm not sure how they think they're going to get this implemented, but I was told, and my source is a reliable source, Gary, uh, I don't know if, uh, about your source. Uh, that would be uh, whether you think it's, yeah, Castro Jr., yeah. Uh, but what was, how, how do they intend to proceed with this? I, I've, it's just been a, uh, and then who is going to declare it law? Of course, they can declare anything law they want to because the Constitution is totally useless. And believe it or not, even the Mises organization is now saying the Constitution is useless after they've been defending it with their people for the past 40 years. It would be by treaty. Yes, and then... Go ahead. I was just going to say treaties override every other law, right? Exactly. Article 6 too. Yeah, I hate to pieces to pieces too. Well, I wanted to ask you, Mike, too. Was Beauregard actually good looking? <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, that's what the name means. Oh, does it? Beauregard? I think so. Yeah, P hey, uh, sir, go ahead. <clears throat> I got a piece of Southern trivia for you, if you don't mind. Put it on me. What southern state led in cotton production prior to 1860? Mississippi. That's my guess. No. Ooh. Louisiana. Yes, again. Hmm. Well, if it wasn't if it wasn't South Carolina. Nope. And it wasn't Mississippi. Nope. There's not Alabama. a lot of. It's Alabama. Now, Alabama wasn't a state, guys. It was <laughs> Texas. <laughs> it was Texas. Uh, hmm. yeah. we're, pl we're, we're playing stump to jump. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, Alabama was a state. I'm just giving you a hard time. I know. Texas. Hmm. Hey, Mike. <laughs> add that. If Texas was the leading cotton producer, add that to that question I asked you about if Texas seceded and didn't join the Confederacy. Declared neutrality. Now, if they're the largest producer of cotton, that was one of the biggest embargoes and problems that happened was the loss of cotton going to the, to Great Britain to feed their uh, mills. Right. So, well, let's let's not forget the tons and tons and tons of textile mills there north. Oh yeah. That operated, especially Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell, Massachusetts was nothing but textile mills, and all of their production depended on cotton from the South. <laughs> Could that be why they wanted to split the South down the Mississippi River into two parts? 
probably i think it has uh i think it uh, has uh some different uh, credibility there uh but you know we look at this and here's the thing and i i tried to explain someone the other day they were talking about secession and it was why do, why would the uh, government be against secession even on a level or even on a county level or anything else people if the people were to secede and set up a system without government then it would flourish beyond everyone's imagination and government can't allow that to happen and yeah, turn into germany's in the 30s right yes yeah. so it looks like obrador and trudeau and biden i mean how would we know if they haven't already formed a north american union i mean that's one of the steps uh, for this one that, world that's already been done right more that was already done that that was done under uh <clears throat> Well, that, that was already Clinton. done a long time ago under Bush. Bush yeah, w, uh, yeah, W. Bush. They yeah, they did ago. it out in the open, and kind of. You know, just yeah, just uh, just I mean, just so we all know here that they put the all these things are already put in place, and by the time you get the memo or the intel, it's a fait accompli. <clears throat> they're just they're just working out the details of how they're going to amalgamate and incorporate it all. Yeah, that's, so, uh, that's what all this uh, yeah. immigration, so, supposed immigration, is about. It, if you go back, if you go back to, uh, I mean, there's different, there's different waypoints uh, over the last uh, 120 years, but you can go back through the Club of Rome and uh, a committee for 300, and they, in the 30s and 40s, they're talking about how they're going to break the world into 10 kingdoms, 10 districts, 10 districts. Uh, Ten Kingdoms is ring a bell with anybody. Uh, and so, Lawrence and Revelation. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this. I, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of amazed when people are amazed. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm yeah, I'm not amazed get, about it. Get surprised. It's hey, a, when, you know, when they go. The United yeah. Kingdom is United Kingdom because it's going to be the Uniting Kingdom of the Ten Kingdoms. Well, D W. Well, uh, DW, yeah, a quick question. Yeah. What was the districts that were created under Nixon? Nixon created a bunch of districts within the United States as well. Yeah, the regions, yeah. right? Yeah, the regions, yeah. yes. And they each have an Israeli leader in them. Did you know that? I found yes. that was the Christian Information Radio. Mm -hmm. were, they were, were, the, were those associated with uh, with a uh, Continuity of government, FEMA, and yes, uh, very much so. Rex eighty, Rex eighty four. Okay, who 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 were the two predominant cap, cabinet members of Nixon's administration? Well, there was uh, there was oh, uh, oh, the oh. guy that says I'm in charge. Cheney uh, and Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld and Cheney. Yeah. And Rumsfeld and Cheney were the creators of the continuity of government system under Reagan. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I know that, 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 um, uh, that all Daryl has all this evidence about the England, the crown and et cetera. But, uh, uh, he makes a couple of statements in here. He says the Vatican owns Britain treaty of 1213 and uh, the Pope can um, abolish any law in the United States, Elements of Ecclesiastical Law, Volume 1, 53 and 54. So doesn't look like they have a lot of power, but in my Genesis 6 book, he does feel that at least the seed of the New World Order, power of the New World Order religion will be back in Rome. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's obviously, you know, for anybody who wants to pay any objective attention to it, uh, you, you have a, a number, quite, a, quite a large number of disparate, different groups uh, over the centuries, and uh, who are all working together for a common agenda. Okay, so uh as as interesting as it is to say aha uh -huh, i found i found the guy i found the, the five people who are doing all this it doesn't matter 
I, I don't believe that information would make uh, absolutely any difference at, at any level. It might be satisfying, <clears throat> but it, it won't, it doesn't make any difference on the ground and to people's lives and, and actually where we're going, the future of humanity. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would just, uh, I would just go to say, is the Vatican part of the story? Well, sure it is. Is, 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 uh, Great Britain a part of the story? Well, sure it is. Is the United States part of the story? Yeah, it is. Uh, are these NGOs and foundations and these legacy organizations and secret societies, are they all part of the story? Well, sure they are. They're all working. These are, these are, these are all interlocking directories. Uh, you know, the thing you're going to have to come to terms with here very soon, if you haven't already, you know, uh, it's going to be grim because these entities, uh, they all, they own, they own, own and control all the food production, all the distribution, transportation, all energy and control of absolutely 100% of all the institutions, including what you call your military. All right. They have, they own it all. Right. And until people quit pissing, pissing in the wind over, over these, uh, these, these, uh, disagreements between each other, you're, 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 you're doomed. Okay. Daryl, we're doomed. Okay. The Bible tells us how yeah. it is. All right. It's yeah. coming down. Yeah. Get out from under. But talking about the UN, we got the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Okay. And remember when they sent from Israel the ambassador to the Vatican to try to get them to release the, Jerusalem from UNESCO? And there was an earthquake, <laughs> interestingly enough. And whether or not they released well, it. I don't know, but this is, who, this is, who, this is who, real binding, yeah. you know, yeah. Who who has any working understanding about what UNESCO is, Mur? That that's, I mean, well, it's extremely right. important. They it's extremely important. It. They planted the sign no, in Philly. No, nobody knows who that is. Well, this is just world oh. one world government, Daryl. They planted a sign in. Oh, oh well, I, listen, I have their books, Mur. I've read them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm looking at the book right now, Julian Huxley. All right. Yeah, I, I appreciate UNESCO. It's a big deal. I think more people should that that don't understand what UNESCO is should should read about UNESCO. It would really explain a lot uh, hey, of what you're experiencing Dar right now. OK, hey, but here's, here's the deal. The United Nations, United Nations took over when Truman made it official. Right. The, there is no new international law here. The United Nations is the international law. It's all been done by treaty and uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's sort of a lost cause. We'll, we'll fill you on about it later about Patel's law of nations. They're moving on past that. There I is figured this law. out about five years ago. They're only okay. The, 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 okay. Well then call it ostensible law, Mer. ostensibly. Okay. Uh, they are the law. Right. And they've done it. You've, they've, it's been it's been done through treaty. Well, you have to get ahead of this. OK. You, you really hey, do. Darryl. You have to get ahead of this. There, you know, we're all uh, these these legal guys are still in Black's Law and it's military and it's international law. So I went on Amazon to look at a, a military law dictionary and Amazon in the top 100 rating. It's, it's, it's rated, um, 10 millionths <laughs> and international right. law is rated 7 millions. Nobody's looking okay. at where the law is even coming from. <laughs> well, okay. Well, that's because that's because everybody's living in the past, just because you acquire some little bit of trivial, divial, uh, bit of, of, uh, uh, trivia information in the new that you didn't know before. And you go, aha, I found another nut. Okay, well, th those those nuts are important and they're relevant, but you're 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 50 years behind the curve, All right? Well, here's something. Hey, so, uh, well, go ahead. Go Gary. ahead. Well, if you go look at all the laws that's been passed and all the cooperative agreements and stuff that your cities, your smart cities, and stuff like that, that's all you out of UNESCO. It's all being pushed by UNESCO. The wildlife stuff. Yes. The, <laughs> 
lack of, uh, yeah. you know, get, get yes. rid of the yes. uh, rural people, bring yeah. them into the corporate cities. It's all UNESCO, every bit of it. The first so, time, you know, the, for, to give you an example, give you an example, the first time, the very first time, okay, that it's found that the word transhumanism is used. Transhumanism is uttered, it's coined by Julian Husk, Husk Huxley, Huckster, Julian Huxley coins that term, Aldous Huxley's brother, uh, uh, who writes Brave New World. Okay, uh, this is this is an important period of time, but you know, uh, this uh, you have to you, you have to fight in the battle space that that we're in. Okay. Well, you, have Darryl, to fight. Darryl, you have to make a comprehension. So let me get, hold on, Mer. Hold on, Mer. Just hold on a minute. Let me give you let me give you an example. If people are talking about international law and the law that you're going under, and you'll hear it. Okay, I've been talking about it for four years. You've heard me talk about it before. It's called the Unidroid. Now, if you want to know where the battle space is. And what's really going on, you would be talking about unidroit law, unidroit private law. Okay. Unidroit private law, to your example, Mer, the headquarters of the unidroit is about four blocks away from the Vatican City. Right. Now, this this is this is where the battle space is at. Let me give you another example where this is going. And you're just starting to see little tidbits of it. And I got books. I've been acquiring books on this whole subject and topic matter, and nobody's caught it. Okay. It goes back to the poor laws in the 1500s, all the way up through uh, the mid 1850s in Britain, and they were called the poor laws. They were also called uh, uh, exclusionary acts and uh, partitioning. And uh, what, what was this all about? Well, this, this is how they controlled their citizens uh, during this period of time that were indigent, poor, or of a different caste and status and you they, they called them the enclosure acts this is the official thing enclosure acts and now you're hearing people talk about well you're going to have your 15 your 15 mile city okay you'll be able to go within 15 miles no 15 this is minutes. nothing new Darryl, they were doing Darryl, this Darryl, they were doing this 300 years ago Mur. it's a 15 minute city you can walk the distance okay. they're a half mile okay. in diameter all right. Okay. Well, then you have your smart grid. So they're going to use CBDC and currency and your track, your personal tracking devices that you all can't live without. Okay. So you'll participate in your own slavery. Didn't, uh, and, and so this, this is the battle space that this is in. Okay. Daryl, I'm a lover. Okay, I'm not a fighter. Oh. So I'm not going to be living well, in the battle space. But if you get an overall view from the past, present and future, Look at Baghdad, Babylon, that enormous embassy they're not, they're not using. That's where they want to go with the headquarters, I think. You know, not the spiritual headquarters, maybe. They'll, they'll maybe have their Moshiach out of Jerusalem. But they, um, it, you know, it's this, it's this all-encompassing thing. You've got to think, we're talking about what went on here. In that same time period, Darwin was taking his grandfather, who had died seven years before he was born, information and Rothschild was funding him to get away from and destroy any idea of God and the Bible. Okay, these are the roots. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. It was did you think we disagreed? Did you thought there was no, a disagreement? I'm, thinking, with I'm, I'm saying this oh, is okay. the overall if you get back, say you jet out to space and look around, come back, okay? This is the thing. We're under Satan's authority in this country. And so is the whole world. Okay. I'm just saying that, that that's the really big picture. 
Well, big big picture is important. And Daryl, my understanding is those ten horns in Revelation are ten kingdoms or districts, and they only are there for a short time, and they usher in the ultimate new world order head, which many would call the Antichrist. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the the the, the ten the ten kingdoms the ten horns. Uh, well, you know, Mike and I, I, Mike and I have talked about this before. I think I brought it up with Cal and I brought it up on several different times. What is the system? What is the thing that precedes the beast? Okay. If you're going to use eschatology, you're going to talk about revelation in the Bible. I'm, I'm all good with that. Okay. So let's, let's, let's put it in, in, uh, in order. Uh, what precedes the beast? Anybody, you know, that's, I mean, that's a genuine open question. Anybody, does anybody have any idea what precedes the beast? These kingdoms. In, in, uh, okay. And what, what, is, what are these called? What's it called? It's named. It, it has a name. Okay. And it's, it's the red dragon. The dragon. And... See, this that, is what gets me about preterism. Some people saying all of the prophecies have been fulfilled. Okay, <laughs> I no, don't think no. so. I don't think so either. <laughs> so, so why? So that I know this sounds like I'm talking about. Oh, he's Daryl's off into the religion and he's doing revelation and eschatology. And religion blah, blah. is no, man for control. You have to know him oh, in person and spirit, oh, oh, and you read his word, and he tells oh, you what's oh, okay. true. That's 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 what I'm trying to share with you here. <laughs> okay. All right. You you look if you want to you, if you want to see the red dragon in in that period of time that builds into the beast system, you start looking at the year fifteen hundred, and you look over the last five hundred years, and you see the you see the dragon spread itself all over the world. The red dragon that precedes it. That United Kingdom, that kingdom, it spreads out, and it started about 500 years ago. It goes through different iterations at different times. It rises, it falls, but this this last 500 year period, in my opinion, is is the uh, uh, that that period of, of the Red Dragon. Now, and I've I've brought this up before. Symbology is very important. All you have to do is go look at the gates leading into the city of London. And and standing outside of the gates protecting it is what, Samuel? Dragons. Red dragons. Not pink, not brown, not <laughs> granite. They're red. <laughs> okay. I mean, hey, Daryl. You know, I'm sorry. Daryl. Yeah. One yeah. problem that people have, even when they look at prophecy in the Bible, is they expect it to happen immediately or within a very short period of time. It's very difficult for people to fathom a 500 year time frame. But then you just have to look to the Bible and realize that Israel was in activity for 400 years. And then you have to think about the fact that we're on God's timeline. We're not on man's timeline. Even the dragon's timeline we're not on. We're on God's timeline. Yeah, yeah. from, from what I'm reading in Genesis 6, they're basically saying in there all the time, over and over and again, man is, or this evil system, is always trying to force its time on God's timeline, and God is just sort of playing around with it. So... Uh... You know, uh, we, we sort of went, we took a hard look turn here, and, and I'm, I'll accept responsibility for that. Uh, but, you know, these things that uh, we're, we're talking about, we, we, you know, during the, the, the Civil War, these things that, uh, you know, Mike brought in and, and the Revolutionary War and this period of time, and all, all these events are extremely important. They're extremely important. They're, they didn't happen in a vacuum. And the people that were involved and affected by it in a lot of ways were as confused and disoriented as the people around us today. They had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, there were perpetrators that absolutely did. 
the perpetrators did, and this is this is why the study of history is, in my opinion, so revealing and important, and gives you uh, real conviction in your understanding uh, ab about uh, <clears throat> this ongoing process. Anyway, so. But Daryl, you yeah. didn't you didn't really take a, another vector from where we were at because, like you said if we can understand what happened in the past then we can project what's going to happen in the future to a certain yeah, extent, well, the, the yeah, old saying that the his, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And if you look at what's been done in the past, then you can see where the rhymes are occurring today. Well, I think that hard turn well, went I, I, straight I, up. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just want to say, I think that, that I think one of the greatest tools and assets that we've had, it's, and it's benefited me uh, to to the highest order, is uh, the uh, education and uh, of of what Mike's done. That is uh, here, here. filled yes, filled all, in the details. All this, here, and, here. Yeah, and all this, uh, I yeah. All this learning for me, including what Michael has brought to my knowledge uh, base, is ultimately there is no there there without God. Well said. Well, here's a here here to your there there. Okay, so Mike, Cal, jump in here. <laughs> No, I can I can expand on that on that gate you know, uh, to the city of London with the red dragon. You'll also find a cross with it too, and that's the cross of Saint George. And that cross of Saint George is also the 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 main cross of the Union Jack or the British uh, flag of Great Britain. And that flag of Great Britain is what was up in the upper left corner of the British East India Company. And if you look at the British East India Company and notice the similarities between it and the, what's called the Betsy Ross flag, you kind of start to put these dots. They're out there, and you got to connect them in pencil because you can't quite exactly get it, but it does paint a, an interesting picture. Why is the Cross of St. George on that in there with the Red Dragon? He financed both sides. It, well, has it also has it also taken over the so-called Christian religion and controlling it? And if it's That's controlling the Christian, the if about. it's controlling the Christian religion, how much of what you're taught as a Christian is actually what's the truth? Because That's these people true. lead. That's where that exactly where this is where your own spirit and understanding and relationship with God have to come in. One on one, hey guys. Yeah, and well, on that Union Jack, remember is what. St. Andrew's flag also, right? St. Andrew's cross. St. Andrew's cross and St. George's cross. And on that stone outside of the uh, city of London, I, I don't know, no, this was uh, after show, I was talking about the uh, red dagger. See the red dagger on there? That's about Watt Tyler in 1381. Because 1348, Jews were held responsible for poisoning water all over Europe except in Poland, where they were. They called it a massacre, of course, but you see how 48 comes through each century how phenomenal it is, right? That's a kind of their marker in time. But hey, Mer uh, hey Joan, somebody by the Jones got their hand up. You just Hi. need to. Yeah. Hi, Joan. I'm ready. <laughs> and I've got to step oh. away. One of the dogs just peed on the carpet. <laughs> so, uh oh, you need go to ahead, go? guys. Oh, uh, yeah. Just one quick question for Mike Gaddy, please. And then we can get back to more important things like that y'all are talking about. Uh, Mike Gaddy, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Beauregard was a Confederate, right? Yes. So why did he fire on Fort Sumter, which was in the Confederacy? Because he was close friends with uh, Robert, uh, the commander of uh, the Union forces. They had been friends for years, and they had negotiated, and, and uh, not only had uh, they promised to evacuate Fort Sumter, which they didn't do, but uh, then, you know, the surreptitious uh, arming of 
And, you know, uh, let's not forget, I'm trying to think the name of the ship that tried to get through and the cadets at VMI fired across the bow to stop. Uh, and in Beauregard's eyes, there was no other way to stop this than to actually force them to leave because they were not going to leave uh, regardless of the treaty. Beauregard was also aware that Fort Pickens had been ordered to be attacked, and uh, he knew that the whole thing was a farce. Now, as to, and then, but he was responsible for getting those men uh, sent home, prisoners of war, sent them all home, and paid for the transportation. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sorry about holding hey, things here, Mike. <laughs> hey, before you... I got to go split wood, but before I do, I want you guys to uh, look at something. If you take 2021, underneath that put 2022, underneath that put 2023, and add them up. 666. Six, 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 six. Yep, so I'm just going to point out, beware of what happens this year, because we're probably going to see some rough stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping in the other direction or praying in the other direction. People need a little break, but it doesn't mean we'll get one. I just want to finish off saying about that red dagger thing that by 1381 the few peasants there were stormed into storm just walked into uh, London to plead their case there wasn't enough of them to grow food for everyone because of this poisoning you know there were less people and they were all kind of problems from <clears throat> being born from people that were poisoned you know so what they did was they took Watt Tyler up on the little where he staged the mayor and the other guy and I'll post the links for this, but they said they were putting a crown on him because it wasn't high enough for the people to see, but they were stabbing him in the neck. So that's where the red dagger came from. Hey, Mur. Yes, sir. Do you draw an analogy with the poisoning of the water with the vaccination? Yeah, I think it's one of those things, you know, where to get away with a large killing and, uh, you know, too, uh, Columbus, we always did in the 1400s, right? Well, he was being, they were being, Jews were being expelled. He was a Jew named Zarco. And they had, mm -hmm. they fought, uh, you know, with one, yet one more child sacrifice, uh, you know, Christian child sacrifice. But at the same time, over in uh, what is now Saudi Arabia, a Jew was taken over in there. Jews are, Saudi Arabians are crypto Jews. And that's why they weren't held accountable, even though they, Claim that 19 number, right, <laughs> on 9-11. So. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. Uh, if I could go back for just a minute to the North American Union, uh, which we're talking about UN international law and especially Agenda 21. With that in mind, why are the elections in Arizona so important as opposed to New Mexico or Utah or other western states and I have an answer I think. We'll tell it we're running out of time. Arizona is key to the control of the waters of the Colorado River without which the entire southwest is uninhabitable. That's agenda 21. That sounds about yeah, right. Who does, who does the water belong to by treaty? By treaty? By Treaty of 1868, who does all that water belong to? Is that Mexico? No. 1868 Treaty, all of that water belongs to the Navajo Indian tribe by treaty. Really? Yes. Well, I know the uh, property line but, uh, of Arizona runs right down the middle of it, and it lies wholly within Arizona from the southern border of Utah to Nevada. And so Arizona is key to that water. I know that. Navajo, that That's, makes sense. Remember when K McCain went there and they kicked him out? <laughs> yes. Well, let's let's go let's go back to the Clinton administration with uh, oh wh who was his Secretary of the Interior, Babbitt. Uh, yeah. Let's let's go back to uh, both Clinton and then George W. Bush. The Navajos had a huge, massive lawsuit against the federal government, something somewhere in the neighborhood of forty-four billion dollars. And uh, Babbitt wouldn't even talk to him. And then Gail Norton, who was appointed Secretary of the Interior under George W. Bush, refused to show up at any hearings. There's a reason for that is because if you go back and look at that 1868, 
the Navajo Indian tribe was given when they were returned from Bosco Redondo and returned back to their native lands there in northern Arizona uh, and New Mexico and even into southern Utah, they were told that that water was, was theirs as long as the grass shall grow. Well, that was a lie, huh? And then oh, what was the river recently? They, they polluted it with a, uh, from a gold mine. They pulled the plug and let all the stuff go down. Yes. And that was intentional, of course. You know, the, the Western states, that, 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 that's sort of a misleading statement. California, Oregon, and Washington wouldn't need any uh, water from anywhere else if they built reservoirs. I think California hasn't built one for, oh, uh, 40 years, and uh, the population has doubled in that time. Oh, yes, and look at uh, what happened with uh, Pelosi and uh, what were the two senators, uh, the two women senators from California that made such a mess there, Barbara something. Anyway, look at what Roger. they did. Yeah, I again, I'm getting old. I forget those names again. But oh. uh, look at what happened with the uh, go up and go up uh, Interstate 5 in California and look at the dead vegetation, the trees and stuff that the deals between those uh, three people, including the former Speaker of the House, those three in California basically took water away from the agricultural industries in California, and that was not an accident. No, uh, Orville was built to hold water purposely for seven years if it's all seven years of drought. They had that thing topped off uh, three years ago, and it was empty this year. Imagine that. Out to the ocean. Oh, the reason I remember about Boxer is she was short and carried a box to stand on at the podium, but after 9-11, old uh, Condola, kind of sleazy rice, said, well, Senator, if you want to get pugilistic, you know, pun, yeah. right, Boxer. So it's all yeah. play. They're all just playing their parts. What was the, what was his name, Feinstein? Oh, dear. You know, her, her maiden name's uh, Goldman. Yes. Well, she didn't change much when she married a Feinstein, did she? Yeah. Well, Goldman, there, Goldman, uh, Feinstein, a, and now Blum. Blum is making... <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that White did not shoot Moscone, that she actually did it herself. I think become so, too. The yep, mayor yep. of San Francisco, which yes. was the beginning oh, of her career. Reptile there. Yeah, I think you're right. Good old Harvey Milk. Mike, how do we get more of you? Well, uh, right now, uh, I'm doing the, the Tuesday night classes, Jim, and I'm just loving what we're doing here, buddy. I appreciate your help with that. And I have a uh, program on uh, the Republic Broadcasting Network on uh, Saturdays at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Hot diggity dog. And um, I am putting together, <laughs> oh, man, I am putting together... I decided to take that 70 lessons that I wrote about four or five years ago on the founding of this country. I'm going to take those 70 lessons and put them into an ebook. Ooh, neat. And uh, just so you know, Jim, the book will be dedicated to you. Oh, my goodness. Nice. I'll buy one or two or three or ten. <laughs> Man. I appreciate so, it, but I think there's probably other people out there that are more deserving. <laughs> well, Jim, I got to tell you, you know, just straight up, I know we're running out of time, and I don't want to bump over on that too much, but uh, your courage over the last two years has been exemplary. Uh, a lot of people could learn a lot from the courage that you have exhibited, sir, and I think you're most deserving of that dedication. Sorry about that. I'm trying to get my button switched over here. <laughs> oh, shucks. <All> right. <laughs> and, 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 hey, it wasn't your dogs that peed in the floor. It was the Russians. They're just trying to let you know. Yeah. This one is visiting from a uh, missionary. And, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's probably Russian. <laughs> she barks yeah. with an accent. <laughs> yeah, uh, It's obviously a Russian dog. Yeah. Well, I want to appreciate everybody that's here. Mike, uh, Cal, DW, the whole crew. I appreciate all of you. Thanks so much for being here. And take care of your bodies, because the only place you have to live, we will see you on Monday. God bless.